us turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians, we haven't for a while though, have we? Uh, we are we are back. We're in 1 Corinthians 15. And last week, um, we didn't gather, but I, Bill and I arrived here and we did the teaching and, and uh, put it out on the internet. And I got as far as verse 50. And uh, what uh, the Apostle Paul has been addressing as we're going through these chapters of chapter 15 is uh, he's been talking of the importance of the resurrection. The resurrection in general, more specifically the resurrection of Christ, and then specifically for us, the resurrection of believers. Also, the order in which the resurrection takes place of the believers in Christ. He'll talk about that and, and how God will resurrect believers in Christ. So here is, as we read the first verse, you've probably heard this before, but this is a sign that's often over, this verse is often over the nurseries in churches. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. You get it? Okay, uh, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, uh, incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So the Bible is saying we don't die. But when you look around, you say, well, of course we die. Everybody dies. The death rate's still 100%. The thing is, no, we just leave these bodies behind. We're, we're given spiritual bodies. We don't die. We just move. We just change. We have a new address. We have a new location. And we change from the earthly to the heavenly. We go from these corruptible bodies, meaning they they age, they smell, they need washing and tending and care and all that, and uh, they keep getting older. We move from, dis, from dishonored to glorious. We'll have a glorious body. We go from being weak in this flesh of our bodies to being powerful in the Lord. We go from sinful in this world to sinless in glory, and we go from aging because... I mean, look around, we're aging. We will be ageless. No more birthdays. Well, we couldn't have enough candles to put in a birthday cake in heaven. We go from this painful thing, you know, where uh, I know I, Pat and I have come to the point where we can recognize the, the way the other walks sometimes. Oh, your back hurts, your leg hurts. You know? <laughs> so we're, but we're going to go into that painless zone. No need for painkillers. And the struggle will be over. Everything will be just so joyful as death is swallowed up in victory, is what he says. And he says, O oh death, O oh death, where is thy sting? O oh grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, the Greek word here for the grave is Hades, or, or hell as we know it, saying that hell has no victory over believers because death has no victory because believers don't die. There's no grave. To, it'll hold our body or our ashes. But for the believer, there's no sting in hell. There's no burning in hell because uh, death doesn't sting. Jesus has conquered death. He, he stretched out his arms on the cross and conquered death. He put it under his feet. And he's given believers victory over death. And it means more as we get older. As we look back on our life and we see more behind than it lies ahead, the fact is there's more ahead than lies behind because we're eternal. To verse 58 now, to close this chapter. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Here's some bees, some things to be. He says, be steadfast. In other words, not movable, not easily moved, settled and steady, 
Be consistent. Be firm in your beliefs. Be firm in your direction. Be firm in your faith in the Lord. Because we're standing on that rock of Christ. He's called the rock. It's a sure foundation. And he says we're always abounding in the work of the Lord. Jesus has said in John 15, 16, You haven't chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So we abound in the work of the Lord. And the reason for that is to bring forth fruit, to bring people into the kingdom, to bring salvation to others. Not that we can save anyone, but we bring the message of salvation to others. And we know that he says our labor is not in vain in the Lord. We can know ahead of time that when you do the work of the Lord, it's not vain. It's not empty. It's not senseless. It's not meaningless because the resurrection is real. And he has that heavenly body waiting for us in a heavenly place. And better than anything we can even imagine. You know, we have the Apostle John. He, he went into heaven, the heavenly realm for a while and uh, uh, he saw some things. And uh, even in human terms, in, in language, it, you, you can't really explain it. So I don't know what heaven will be like. I've seen pictures. I've seen, I've read descriptions. What I do know is that God made it. I do know that God lives there and he's the creator and he can do anything he wants. So you know it's got to be the greatest that there is because he's the architect, he's the designer, he's the builder. And we know that he's on the throne. He rules and reigns there. He's in charge. He's everlasting. He's, he's immeasurable. It's a holy place. God and the angels are there. Jesus is there. I also know that God's going to wipe away All tears from our eyes. All tears. That means all. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That's in Revelation 21, almost the end of the chapter. And remember, I love, years ago I came upon this. Somebody came up with an acronym for Bible, B-I-B-L-E, Basic Information Before Leaving Earth. And for those who may hear this message and don't have Jesus Christ, don't leave this earth without Jesus Christ. And if you have him, just rejoice if you have him, because the best is yet to come. And so that's chapter 15. Let's take a look now at chapter 16. I intend to go to the end of this chapter today and finish 1 Corinthians. So now Paul's going to complete this first letter to the Corinthian church. He's addressed a lot of things here within the first letter. He's addressed the divisions that were popping up in the church, the need that they had for Holy Spirit power to be led by the Spirit, not by the Spirit of man. And uh, he's talked about the sins in the church, the carnal Christians, the spiritual pride that comes up when we have the gifts and exercise them and start bragging about them, and uh, the idolatry that was in the church, the uh, things that are still around today that he addressed what do we do with these meats that are offered to idols can we do that and and how about the spiritual gifts as we got into chapter 12 all the spiritual gifts and then followed up by chapter 13 the more excellent way that unconditional agape love of god and now he's just talked about the importance of the resurrection in For the last chapter, he's going to talk about something that we Americans in particular, and me humans in general, hold close to our chest. It's what do we do with the giving of ourselves and our money? How do we handle that? Verse 1, he says, Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring you your liberality uh, to Jerusalem, meaning your financial gift. And if it is fitting that I go also, they shall go with me. So the uh, Corinthian church met the first day of the week, It's called the Lord's Day because it's the Lord's Resurrection Day. And it's a tradition that was begun early and it started, it's continued through today. 
And in verse 1 he says, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia. So his reason, he gives a reason for writing is to answer a letter from the Corinthian church concerning the collection um, for Jer- the Jerusalem church. And he's dealing with uh, three different areas of stewardship, too. Oftentimes we think of giving as, as a financial giving. It's not all just financial. Money is one of the things, but uh, as opportunities present themselves, what do we do with those opportunities? And uh, the, the other thing that we have to steward is our own, our own skills, our own abilities, our own people. And uh, he, he's just making a point that, you know, it's all God's money, and it's really important that it be used wisely, that it not be wasted. We shouldn't be thinking about it as ours. And uh, the early church had needs, as we all have needs. And one of the principles we all need to understand that even spiritual ventures like a church takes carnal money. You know, we still have to turn the lights on and, and uh, pay the rent to the landlord and buy coffee grounds so that we can stay awake and all of that. So uh, if you want to turn to Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 41, Acts 2.41, the early church in their sharing. Uh, Let's see here. Yeah, there it is. Acts 2.41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about... 3,000 souls. Imagine having an altar call and 3,000 people step forward. It's a lot of potty calls. There's a lot of coffee. There's a lot of baptisms, a lot of counseling. And they continued steadfastly. This is one of the, the verses that we use as the Calvary, for the Calvary Chapel movement. It's Acts 2.42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. That's what we do. We gather together. We go through the doctrine of of Christ in in the Bible. We have times of fellowship. We break bread around the table once a month for our pot faith dinners. We break bread in communion and uh, and we pray together. It's a good. That's a. You don't have to get complicated about meeting and why we meet and how we meet. We meet to glorify God and and how we meet is fellowship, uh, breaking of bread and prayer and uh, the apostles' doctrine. And he says, in fear, verse 43, came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So the early church shared all their stuff. They had stuff, but they shared it all. And then a little further on in Acts 4, in verse 33, look at the results. And with great power, the apostles gave witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according to as he had need. So they're selling everything and just bringing it uh, to take care of all the needs around them. I remember my pastor, Bill, years ago said, I went to him and said, our relatives are, are telling me that that um, to belong to this church, you have to bring all our money and give it to you. And he just laughed and said, so where is it? <laughs> it wasn't true. It never was true. So it, uh, you know, what it did was, if you can imagine, if we all sold everything we had and put all the money in a pile, it would be great for a while. But it, eventually you run out. And it was very effective for a while. But they had limited resources, and eventually it ran out. And, and there, were a, there were a lot of needs in the early church. As there, even today, that's never gone away. And their resources were dwindling because they had, they had needs. They had people that abused uh, the body of Christ. Um, and, uh, and people that do that can use up the resources of the body of the Christ. Then they did it and do it today, too. 
And Jesus did say in Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So Paul has this, he's talking about this collection for the saints. It was intended as a special missionary offering. And uh, we can learn some basic principles here concerning Christian stewardship and giving. He first, he says that giving should be an act of worship. And uh, I remember the first time I heard Bill say this, I was really shocked. He says, anybody who put something in the agape box, if you want it back, just tell Rick, he'll give it back to you. He'll go, what? Yeah, give it back. So each member of the Corinthian church certainly had a share coming into them week, a week for that week. And uh, he's saying that they would give of that simply each week. But it should be, it shouldn't be just out of duty to do that. But it should be an act of worship uh, to our resurrected Savior. And we can give without loving, uh, but we can't love without giving. In 2 Corinthians, later on in chapter 9, we'll see that he says, Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And, you know, it's... uh, it's hard to think about that attitude of laughing and dropping money into the agape box. Oh, I can't wait to give this. I can't wait. It's more like, Do I have to. <laughs> but the the Jews, they were used to, they were accustomed to tithe at 10% as God had prospered them, he says. So if you have more, you give more. If you have less, you give less. I think I've said this many times, but I knew a man who was uh, a head of a, a, a Kodak complex, and he had a s- several hundred employees, made a lot of money. He lived on 10% and tithed 90%. Yeah. I didn't know how to recruit him. so you know. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, you have more, you give more. You have less, you give less. It's simple. He doesn't give really any proportion uh, for New Testament believers, but... I think 10% is not a bad starting point. I remember when I, before I was saved, listening to a Christian tell, telling me about tithing. And, and I said, you do what? You give one out of every $10 to your church? What are you, crazy? Well, I grew up to see the wisdom of that. I, I ran across a saying, when your outgo exceeds your income, then your upkeep will be your downfall. <laughs> so, you know, certainly there's... Um, uh, there's a, a wisdom to how we handle our money, and a part of it goes to the Lord. But as the Lord provides more, we can give more. If we have abundance, we can give more. If we have less, we have to give less. And uh, some of our income obviously has to be spent to live, and some invested in the kingdom of God. You think about it again, who owns it all? And I remember someone say to me, hey, God lets me keep 90% of it. It's all his, and he lets me keep 90%. So God owns it all. But the same thing is, it should be not from pressure. Giving should not be pressure. It shouldn't be arm twisting, not because we've got a thermometer on the wall that says how what our giving needs to get to. It shouldn't be guilt trip put on anyone. That's not how we do it. That's uh, why we have a box. You just drop it in. It's a way to show appreciation to our Lord through tithes and offerings. Oh, oh, tithes is giving to the church, to your local church, wherever you worship. And offerings is giving to others and other ministries. Sometimes you see a need someone has. That's an offering. Uh, or it maybe there's a ministry in Africa you like to support. But in verse 3, he says, Whomsoever you shall approve by your letters. He says, just handle everything honestly, he says. He's saying by spirit-filled men of character. And you know what happens when um, you hear about a ministry mismanaging money? Used most of the this movies you see in, in um, Hollywood that deal with ministries will show them mishandling the money. And um, when that happens, uh, you lose that testimony of uh, grace and, and generosity toward the Lord. And Paul, he was carrying the money. He didn't touch the money. He was just the carrier. And uh, he was a messenger bringing it. And uh, 
the, the message for all who handle money is to, to stay above reproach. Be honest about it all. Keep accurate records. Hide nothing. Keep a high level of accountability. And when at all possible, always have two people handle the money. We do that here. And uh, the reason is what 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, to abstain or stay away from all appearance of evil. Don't even make it look like you're doing something wrong here. So I know what the uh, weekly and the monthly income of our fellowship is. I know where it's spent. But I don't know who gives. I don't know how much everyone gives. Each person gives. And I don't want to. I don't want that to influence me in any fashion. Verse 5, he goes on and says, uh, now, now I come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, in winter with you, that you may bring me on my journey wherever I go. For I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. So he's speaking of the, another area of stewardship here, opportunities. We get opportunities. I like what he said in Galatians 6.10. He says, as you have, therefore, opportunity, let us do good unto all. And King James says all men, but it means all, everyone, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Take care of the body of Christ first, because we need to be healthy to minister to others. Ephesians 5.15 says, see then that you walk circumspectly. You know, the circumference is, it's the area, it's the mark around the circle. So, you know, be looking around you, watch around you, know what's going around, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And they've always been evil. We've always lived in a fallen world. So Paul, he's redeeming the time and his opportunities, uh, aware of the enemy and his tactics, so those that misuse the church because the days are evil. And uh, this is a calling really for the whole body of Christ, not just the pastor, but to redeem the time. Don't waste time. I waste enough of it. But we need to be ministering to the needs of, of one another and use every opportunity we can to minister to others and look for opportunities to serve. Verse 10, he goes on, he says, Now, if Timotheus comes, see that he may be with you without fear. For he works the work of the Lord, as I also do. Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come to me, for I look for him with the brethren. As teaching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come to you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time. But he will come when he shall have convenient time. So oh, Paul, he's concerned about Timothy's welfare. He wanted to visit him to visit at Corinth or visit Corinth, and Acts 18 says he did go there. So, and Timothy was young; he was inexperienced, and he needed encouragement because he needed to grow, and he was unsure of himself. And Paul feared that the Corinthian church might not accept Timothy. And certainly, Paul knew what that like was like not to be accepted. He was not accepted in a lot of places he went. After all, he was a Christian persecutor. Then he shows up at church. So people had trouble accepting Paul after his conversion because of his past and his behavior before his conversion. Now he's afraid the Corinthians won't accept Timothy because he's young and inexperienced. Boy, the young, they have energy to burn. I, I desire more of that energy. They, they lack the maturity and the wisdom, perhaps, but they really have lots of energy. Paul says, don't despise him. Don't treat him as if he's nobody. Don't treat him as if he's not important or worthless. Don't look down on him with contempt just because he's young. Churches should have their arms open to the young because many die when there are no young people to take over. That's one of the fears I have is that we'll just keep getting older and no one will be stepping in to take over. But the next generation has to be taught of Jesus also and be prepared to take over to tell the world about Jesus Christ. You know, look at it. 2,000 years later, so far so good. And the young people are important to the life of a church. So Paul, he's looking, he wanted Apollos also to come to Corinth. 
And, and Apollos didn't want to come. Why? Well, 1 Corinthians 1.12 says, Now this I say that every one of you says, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas and I'm of Christ. Seems like there was early division within the church and there was rivalries between the leaderships and uh, of whose pastor was best. And maybe Apollos just didn't even want to deal with it. But uh, Paul and Apollos, they didn't have any rival with each other. They weren't struggling with one another. They weren't fighting with each other. The, the rivalry existed only in the minds of the Corinthian church and the other people. Paul and Apollos were brothers in Christ, and they saw themselves as brothers, as fellow servants of Jesus Christ, willing to serve side by side or apart wherever God might call them. And that's how we should be, ready to serve side by side or apart wherever God might call us. In verse 13, he goes on and says, <clears throat> Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong, let all your things be done with charity. So first Paul encourages the young believers to continually watch, stay awake, be alert, be on guard. The enemy, like a roaring lion, roars about the earth, seeking whom he may desire. desire. Devour. In the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 26, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but, you know, the flesh is weak. We've experienced that. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 5, You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. But let us watch and be sober. In Matthew 13, Jesus said to his disciples, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. How does that happen? Well, by reading the word of God, by prayer. Our eyes will see his work in our own lives. We can watch that work going on in the lives of others just by knowing what the word of God says. We need to keep praying. I keep praying for my eyes to see things because I miss so much that I'll hear things that I need to hear especially his will in my life and in the life of our fellowship. And secondly, he says, stand fast in the faith. Stand fast. It sounds contradictory. You can run fast. How do you stand fast? Well, this means stand securely. Know what it is that the Word of God teaches. Don't listen to false teachers. They're all around the place. One of the giveaways that they'll point to themselves oftentimes instead of to Jesus but don't listen to those false teachers. Watch out for false doctrines. The Holy Spirit will give you a sensitivity to false and true doctrines. You need to be standing for that gospel of Jesus Christ and oppose those who oppose it or teach anything else but it. Chapter 6 of Ephesians is awesome, called the whole armor of God. But verse 13 says, Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day having done all to stand. This is the evil day. We're always in the evil day. And when we have done all, we're still standing. We're still standing for the Lord. What do we stand for? What do we stand in? For faith in God and His Word. It's His Word. We're not, we shouldn't be in the pulpit to teach funny stories all the time. Once in a while, it's fun to, to lighten up. But we need to be studying God's Word, growing in our faith and growing in our knowledge of God's Word. Thirdly, he says, interesting, quit ye like men. He's saying, be courageous like a real man. Quit living like immature men if that's what you're doing. Have the courage of a man of God, a man that fights from your knees. How do we do this? Well, one of the things is shown in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. <coughs> If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. It, it takes a lot of courage, man or woman, to stand for Christ in this day. People will mock you. They'll make fun of you. I was just near someone recently and yesterday that Jesus Christ, and it wasn't praise. I said, he's my Lord. Yeah. That's who you're talking to, that's who you're talking about. But we stand with the Lord against the things of this world that would taint us, that would foul us. 
we fight from our knees in prayer. Fourthly, he says, be strong. Uh, to strengthen, to be made strong, to increase in strength by increasing our knowledge of God, to have that real strength of the Lord that comes from knowing his word so that we can stand against the world and having done all to continue to stand. And finally, he says in verse five, or the fifth thing to do here is do all things with love, agape love, not just conditional love, but agape love, unconditional agape love, live in it, do all things wrapped in love. Remember 1 Corinthians 13, we just did that recently, that more excellent way. May all that we do be filtered through that more excellent way of God's agape love. And no matter how gifted we are, without agape love, without God's kind of love, we're nothing. It's all for nothing. And uh, Paul knew that the, the unconditional agape love of God would heal the divisions that were going on inside the Corinthians church. And he'll heal the divisions that go on inside any church. Paul said in Galatians 5.13, by agape love, serve one another. First Peter 4.8, agape love covers the multitude of sins. We're told to love God with unconditional agape love because our tendency is not to love that way. Our tendency is to love conditionally. I don't like him because he doesn't like me. I'll love you if you'll do this, or I'll love you when you do this. That's our fallen nature to love us if and when. Agape love is not certainly accepting or condoning all behavior. It's loving anyway, loving the person, not the sin. Loving despite, uh, despite bad behavior. Not loving the behavior, but loving the person despite the behavior. He goes on in verse 15 and says, I beseech you, therefore, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first roots of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Addicted to ministry. Well, that you submit yourselves unto such, and to everyone that helps with us and labors. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaius, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, way back in the first chapter, he says, I baptized also the household of Stephanus. And he talks about addictions. There are a lot of addictions today. Stephanus was a great example of an addiction. He was addicted to ministry. Whenever he saw a need, he was ready to work to meet it. He was ready to jump right into it. He, he didn't need to be to wait to be asked. Or he wasn't one that said, somebody should do something about that. I remember when I tried that at Finger Lakes years ago when I was a young believer. He said, you know, that should be taken care of. I think it had to do with the mirror. And Jack Trent was there. He said, your vision, your mission. <laughs> That's where I got it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I decided I would only mention those things I was willing to take care of. <laughs> but the body of Christ is really effective when people see needs, recognize a need, and are willing to meet that need. Because pastors aren't the only ones in ministry. All Christians are in ministry. In one way or another, we serve in different ways. We have different opportunities. We have different ministries. And he says, submit yourselves to Stephanus. He, he's a good example. He's the fruit, first fruits of Achaia. He's the first one that, uh, of, uh, of, in Achaia that, uh, with his household to step forward for Christ. It was a brave move, a courageous move in a worldly society such as that filled with injustice and immorality. Wait a minute, isn't that what today's world is like? <laughs> it takes a lot of courage today to stand for Jesus Christ. It's getting more and more unpopular. But does it matter? When you hold the truth, I mean, what more could we want? We live in a worldly society. It's filled with immorality. It's filled with injustice. And Christians are often mocked called intolerant for recognizing sin. We, we name sin and we're intolerant. We're intolerant because we call sin, sin, and not an alternative lifestyle or just another thought process or another opinion. 
And, and at a time when the Corinthian church was filled with problems and divisions, and weren't always exercising their gifts in the proper way. They were arguing. They were dividing. Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaius all mentioned here, they filled a need that was lacking in the Corinthian church. They were faithless, or, or faithful. They were tireless, I should say. They ministered in a tireless manner. They just didn't give up. They didn't quit. They saw needs. They moved forward and filled them. They simply served simply. They're refreshing to the Apostle Paul, like a breath of fresh air. When you see somebody who just simply serves simply. Verse 19, as we get near the end of the chapter here. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another. Greet you one another with a holy kiss. The salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. Remember Aquila and Priscilla? They were tent makers with Paul and Pontus. They were from Pontus. Paul met them in Corinth. They were tent makers. And it says in Acts 18, after these things, Paul departed, departed from Athens and came to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, and later came from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. And he came unto them, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, and, and by their occupation they were tent makers. So Aquila and Priscilla now, they have this church in their own home, and when Paul moved from Corinth to Ephesus, Aquila and Priscilla moved with him, helped to start a church there, and this is uh, where they discipled Apollos. And now Paul left them there to oversee the ministry so he could go on to Antioch, just part of church history. They were trustworthy. They were faithful servants. And they still had that church in their home. You know, as we wrap up the chapter here, <coughs> if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love with you, my love be with you, all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Interesting. Paul makes a bold statement here. He says, anyone who doesn't love Jesus Christ, anyone who does not acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord is anathema, accursed. Maranatha, the Lord cometh. They're anathema because the Lord's coming. They're accursed because the Lord's coming. We need to beware and to be aware that the Lord is coming. He said he'll return. If the Bible says it, it'll happen. We can be sure of it. And anyone who hasn't placed their faith in him is accursed, is cast away. That's the one unforgivable sin, rejecting Jesus Christ. These aren't my words. These are God's words. And anyone who has a problem with these words don't have a problem with me other than the mouthpiece. I'm just a mouthpiece speaking God's words. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, it's time to put your faith, your faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we have him in our heart, we look for needs around us so that we can fulfill those needs according to our means. We don't have the means to do everything. It's not always financial. Sometimes it's just to pray with someone. Sometimes it's just encouragement. Hebrews 3.13 says, exhort one another daily while it is today. But we should use that gift, whatever the gift is that God's given us, use it so that it doesn't go to waste, that it doesn't get old and wear out and become ineffective. In the year, I'll close with an interesting story. In Spain in 109 AD, that's three digits, 109 AD, a Roman aqueduct was built in Segovia, Spain. For 1,800 years, it carried water from the mountains to that hot, thirsty city. Nearly 60 generations drank from its flow. Then came another generation recently who said, this aqueduct is so great, a marvel, that it ought to be preserved for our children as a museum piece. We shall relieve it of its centuries-long labor. They did. They laid modern pipes iron pipes. They gave the ancient bricks and mortar a reverent rest like it deserved. 
and the aqueduct began to fall apart. The sun beating down on the dry mortar caused it to crumble. The bricks and stones sagged and threatened to fall. What ages of service could not destroy, idleness disintegrated. What an incredible lesson to us. We need to keep moving. We need to keep working the works of the Lord. We need to keep serving the Lord. So he said in Colossians 3.23, he says, Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. That the thing is that who, wherever we work, our first line supervisor is Jesus. He's the one we please. He's the one that we're working for. We may work for an industry, but we really work for Jesus. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that incredible that we have an inheritance uh, from the King of Glory, the creator of the universe. We have a, a body that won't fade away. It's going to be eternal in the heavens where it won't fade away. We'll have a house that won't fade away. We'll be walking and moving about on streets of gold, I guess, it's gold-ish looking at least, that won't fade away. Nothing will fade away there. We have all that to look forward to. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord. What a wonderful promise you've given us that we don't have to just think of the things of this day, Lord, the day that we're in, but we have uh, so much more to look forward to, Lord, so much more uh, that your promises tell us of, Lord, and you give us just enough of a glimpse that we can know that it's better than anything we've ever seen. So, Lord, thank you for your promises. and. Thank you, Jesus, that you were faithful to the cross, all the way to the cross, Lord. Thank you for salvation, and we will love you forever, Lord, as you love us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.